in that sacred place so simple and so serene, I recalled anew the ways in which Gandhi's teachings have touched the lives of so many millions of people in my own country. When I was growing up on a farm in the state of Georgia, in the heart of the southern United States, an invisible wall of racial segregation stood between me and my black classmates, schoolmates, playmates, when we were old enough to know what segregation was. But it seemed then as if that wall between us would exist forever. But it did not stand forever. It crumbled and fell. And though the rubble has not yet been completely removed, it no longer separates us from one another, blighting the lives of those on both sides of it. Among the many who marched and suffered and bore witness against the evil of racial prejudice, the greatest was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He was a son of Georgia and a spiritual son of Mahatma Gandhi. The most important influence in the life and work of Dr. King, apart from his own religious faith, was the life and work of Gandhi. Martin Luther King took Gandhi's concepts of nonviolence and truth force and put them to work in the American South. Like Gandhi, King believed that truth and love are the strongest forces in the universe. Like Gandhi, he knew that ordinary people, armed only with courage and faith, could overcome injustice by appealing to the spark of good in the heart even of the evildoer. Like Gandhi, we all learned that a system of oppression damages those at the top as surely as it does those at the bottom. And for Martin Luther King, like Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolence was not only a political method, it was a way of life and a spiritual path to union with the ultimate. <laughs> These men set a standard of courage and idealism that few of us can meet, but from which all of us can draw inspiration and sustenance. The nonviolent movement for racial justice in the United States, a movement inspired in large measure by the teachings and examples of Gandhi and other Indian leaders, some of whom are here today, changed and enriched my own life and the lives of many millions of my countrymen. I am sure that you will forgive me for speaking about this at some length. I do so because I want you all to understand that when I speak of friendship, between the United States and India, I speak from the heart as well as the head. I speak from a deep first-hand knowledge of what the relationship between our two countries has meant in the past and how much more even it can mean for all of us in the future. For the remainder of this century and into the next, the democratic countries of the world will increasingly turn to each other for answers to our most pressing common challenge. How our political and spiritual values can provide the basis for dealing with the social and economic strains to which they will unquestionably be subjected. The experience of democracy is like the experience of life itself, always changing, infinite in its variety, sometimes turbulent, and all the more valuable for having been tested by adversity. We share that experience with you, and we draw strength from it. Whatever the differences, 
between my country and yours, we are moving along the path of democracy toward a common goal of human development. I speak for all Americans when I say that I am deeply grateful that you and I travel that road together. Thank you very much. human liberties and a democratic form of government. The health and vitality of our democratic polity stands proven. The last parliamentary elections in India have dramatically proved the people's involvement in politics and their faith in democratic values as being the only sound basis for obtaining social justice. <laughs> Equality and equity are enshrined in our political system. The dignity of the individual and the sanctity of the human being are underlying principles of the constitutional ethos of the Republic of India. India's concept of par participative democracy flows out of our ancient philosophy, which looked upon each being as embodiment of the same life force. Our concern with man reaches out beyond our national borders. As you rightly believe, Mr. President, an alliance for survival is needed transcending regions and ideologies. If we are to assure mankind a safe passage to the 21st century. The world is in ferment. Nations are worried today as much about their economic security as their political freedom. Democracy has the obligation to secure for the citizens not only peace but also freedom from want. A cooperative world order is therefore the vital need of the modern interdependent world which is dominated by demands for higher standards of human existence. We Indians feel that democratic nations particularly owe it to their commitment to equality and dignity of man to respond in partnership with all nations in collective action to the human need for peace and prosperity everywhere. Our is a vision of a better India in and for a better world. Indo-American relations date back many, many years, in a sense, to the discovery of America itself. Capacity for assimilation has been the common characteristic of our national lives. Your visit, we are sure, will help greater mutual understanding and introduce new perspectives to the relations between the two great democracies. In concluding, Mr. President, let me once again say how happy we are at your coming to our country and convey to you and your distinguished and gracious wife, Mrs. Rosalind Carter, and through you to the members of your Congress and the people of the United States of America, the greetings and feelings of goodwill and friendship of the members of the Indian Parliament and the millions of my fellow countrymen whom you represent.